There's chloroform on it. Okay, no drinking. And there's a stick in here. Pretty crude. Okay? And it's soaked in there, and this stick is soaked, and there's the magic vapors falling off of the end of the stick. Now, sometimes you have to dip it back in and try again. And if this is the surface of the <coughs> boat, you have to get very close. Without uh, touching. Without touching, that's right. I used to just use this stick in without the... Just do that. Very close. You will see the effect when it happens. If you wave it around up here, nothing will happen. You need to put it close, and then you will see them go out like that. So you need to watch. Um, probably we're breaking some rule using chloroform outside of the fume for a certain you want to minimize your exposure to it. But uh, I don't know any other real good way to do this. Then the next thing is to pick up with the grid. Make sure that your grids are clean. If they're oxidized or dirty, the sections won't stick. Picking up the grids is a challenge. And the tool that makes the biggest difference in terms of whether you're able to be successful or not are the forceps that you use. Now, these are the genuine article. Brand new, unwrapped, fresh from Tetella, perfection in tweezers. They're so perfect we have to call them forceps instead of tweezers, right? So, uh, you'll notice these things are sharp, the tips are straight, they come together perfectly, and you'll be able to handle the grids way more efficiently if you have a good pair of tweezers. Um, I'm going to uh, take out a little cap, I want to make sure you put the cap back on to protect the tips. Normally, tweezers are handled more like hair brushes and toothbrushes, you have your own, right? Um, but under the circumstances, these guys can cost $40, $50 each, and that's probably pretty rich for your blood. So what I'm going to do is put one set of these tweezers someplace that we decide, and then if you want to practice using them, you, you can, and you see if there's any difference between the ones you have and, and these, and if it's worth it to you, um, we can find a way to order some of these for you. Right. Another trick for forceps is to make them into locking tweezers, which you'll find useful. Uh, are these little O-rings? These little O-rings slip on the back side. Do you get these guys at the bookstore? Do they give you O-rings with your tweezers? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is the poor man's way of making locking tweezers. This goes on here like this, and when you want to lock them, you slide this up, and it holds tight when you let go. You want to let go, you back it off, and they're back to normal. There are also reverse action tweezers, which I could never get used to because in those, when you squeeze them, they open, and they're normally closed. There are also all kinds of other variations of tweezers, and, and some people will find a style which suits them better than others, but these are sort of the baseline standard one that you'll find people who section use it. Where would we put this? You could have like a sign-out sheet with them too. So oh, that's a good idea. So yeah, all right. So we'll do that. We'll put it, um, I'll let you know where we put it. Now your tweezers may or may not be good enough. Uh, if you're a patient person and you learn how to handle your tweezers, then it'll be good enough, but I could never do it. Your tweezers, to me, feel like pliers, like big pliers. Um, and everybody drops their tweezers now and then, and this is a little kit for re-straightening out the points and sharpening the tips, sort of to refurbish your tweezers if, if they can get ready. And you can probably improve the tweezers you have by polishing down the tips so they're a little sharper and finer. So that's that. Over here, this chart on the wall shows you various styles of grids. 
and the open area and the size of the, the block, the, the holes and stuff like that. So we're going to be using a mesh grid which will look more like this, small holes for more support. Bigger holes like this give you more viewing area but not as much support to the sections. So we want more support. These guys, you see this guy has a little tab on it. Other kinds of grids are slotted, some with parallel bars. There's a huge variation in the style of grids. And everybody just kind of, depending upon what their project is, may choose a different style of grid for a certain application. And so some of them are organized. These are 200 mesh copper grids. There's a whole bunch of little vials in here. These are old. They may need to be cleaned. Uh, here's uh, a whole bunch of different kinds. You can just sort through there. And if you want to, open them up. These are tabbed 200 mesh copper grids. Some people like a little handle on the grid so that they can grab them easier. Uh, if you look in the TED catalog, or the EMS catalog, you'll find entire sections on tweezers. So here's the tweezer section. See so many different versions and styles that you're bound to find one that works for the job you're doing. And the same thing is true of grids. There's a whole section here on different kinds of grids. Sizes, shapes. They're all three millimeters roughly in diameter, but the pattern of the support part uh, is very hexagonal, squares, circles, dots, slots. So you, somebody is using them for something, right? So you should sometimes be prepared to consider what the most appropriate style of grid would be for a project that you're working on. It may not be 300 mesh grid. So you will pick up your sections somehow, right? And then you will get the water dried off of them, and then you have to store them someplace. These are two examples of grid storage boxes. If you don't use the double stick tape on a slide, these two styles. Um, I think I brought like a whole drawer full of these things from Santa Cruz. But we had an open house one day and somebody cleaned up, just like your mom. I can't find it now. <laughs> but but if, but if it if you want this, then we can go on a you know search patrol and try to locate them because there must be at least a hundred of these things. Uh, you see, they have the little slot, so you slide this open. You put the grid in here, and you record the coordinates, line four, space number three, and you know where it is. If you're not careful, you smish your grids when you put them in here. And then usually, because of static electricity, the grid gets dragged out as you open the little top, right? So you do need to be careful. I found that with my bad eyes, my eyes are not bad, they're just old, and I can't look at things closely enough. So I have much more success now if I try to do some of these operations by looking through the stereoscope. Just because I can see more about what's going on and I don't smoosh and crunch things up so much. Same thing is true of loading a grid into the specimen holder for the TEM. Um, it's not enough to sort of frisbee that grid into the end of the holder and then clunk the, the trap door down hoping that everything's in the right spot. Okay? You've got to really make sure that the grid is in that little detent area and then carefully lower the, the, the seat. The other kind of uh, grid box that you might run across is uh, this guy. A uh, similar kind of situation except that instead of a slide off type thing, this is a circle with holes in it and you go around and put the circle, the, the empty circle, the hole over the top of the slot that you want to open load or unload. Uh, these also have the same problem of dragging the grids out and find grids stuck in between and stuff like that. But if you have to move over, only one grid falls out. And in fact, if you move this so that it's over an empty hole, yeah. no grids will fall out. 
And so this is all part of the strategy to try to keep track of what you have. Since you cannot see, everything looks the same. You have to find a way to keep track of what's what. And, and without a doubt, if you have your grids in a um, petri dish, not tied down, you're going to bump something or somebody, or somebody's going to bump it, and they all go before it. And you don't know what it is like. So you do need to work on some kind of way to keep track of these things. When you get to that point, the next thing to do is to practice uh, post staining, which we usually do over where Aaron is standing. And there's a tray there, I think, that has some equipment on it. Yeah, so that's the post staining area. And at this point, until you get some sections, you won't actually go through post staining, but um, you're welcome to practice just with a plain drop of water and a plain grid floating and picking up and releasing from the tweezers and that sort of thing. So that that becomes second nature to you. Okay? So, jobs to do. Picture of an untrimmed block in a stereoscope. Picture of a trimmed block in a stereoscope. If you can, it'd be very cool if you put a scale bar out of those pictures. Do you remember how to do that? You get a Ted Keller ruler, you take a picture of that, and put a scale bar on an image J. That way I can tell what size the block face that you trimmed down to is. Next thing would be the thick section, an untrimmed block in the microtome. Uh, make a glass knife, put a boat on it, make those thin sections, and then pick them up and mount them on a glass slide. Uh, stain them and take a picture in a compound microscope to show that you've got thick sections on a glass bar. Is that an untrimmed block? You can do it with an untrimmed block. You may wish to trim the surface off so you get down into the tissue, but you don't have to worry about the sides so much at that point. After that, you can trim to a smaller size and try doing some thin sections. You can try thick sections of the smaller block face just to ensure that there's tissue there. And then you can try thin sections. So go ahead and give that a shot. Um, there's no way to really look at the thin sections on the grid. You can sort of see them if you use phase contrast. But they're very thin and, and it's hard to see. So we won't, we won't take any pictures right away of those things. And then we'll have some sections ready to post stain next week and then take them into the market. In the meantime, you can be practicing using the TEM. Where do we stand in terms of TEM practicing for everybody? Basic alignment. Have you accomplished basic alignment? You're good at basic alignment? Okay, take some pictures of the holy grid. Is there a holy grid in there? Secret cubby. Well, there was, but somebody robbed the secret cubby. Oh, no. Yeah, so I'll have to get a, I'll have to get a, a holy grid into the secret cubby. And then you can practice at whatever level of skill you have at this time for taking pictures of holy grids. And you should take like an under focus, an in focus, and an over focus, through focus series of a holy grid. And save all those pictures so that they can go into your lab. So, that's the process from plastic embedded set, uh, tissue through thin sections and into the microscope. That's one part of this class. The other part of this class is the uh, actual tissue processing from alive to in the plastic. So you want to take a little break and then we meet on the other side of the hallway in the prep lab and I'll point out the location of some of the chemicals and stuff that we're going to use. <coughs> or should we just go there right now? Hmm? We should just go there right now? Okay, we're going to front.